So we have distributed an abstract here, but probably not all, it's short, probably not all of you have seen it, and maybe it will be a gentle way of introducing you into this uh, huge problem. Uh, so the title is Visual Distortions in Macular Degeneration, uh, Quantitative Diagnosis and Correction. Correction, I was a bit nervous about using the word correction because, I mean, it's a problem has been known for a hundred years, roughly, uh, and uh, it is far from corrected. If you use the word corrected, completely corrected. This is, uh, I think, aims at a limited but important part of it. Uh, and correction can be uh, used in its other sense, just improving somebody's learning a language and he's uh, making a few mistakes and you can correct those mistakes. That doesn't mean that he's now speaking perfectly. So it's in that sense that we are talking about correction, and that is, in fact, already implied by the first line that I've just read you, visual distortions in macular degeneration. Macular de degeneration is very widespread. It is the uh, leading cause of blindness. Uh, it affects mostly, uh, it affects seriously, mostly older persons. And of course, nobody can define that exactly, and different people use different numbers, but roughly, uh, st maybe starts at 60, and by the time you've reached the 80s or even 90s, uh, it's quite likely that you have some degree of, will have some degree of macular degeneration. Uh, I was in India, uh, partly in this connection, and uh, as you know, India is uh, uh, pretty close to becoming the most populous country in the world. Uh, uh, so there are lots of millions of people who have macular degeneration there. And they have an excellent institute that uh, deals with all forms of vision. It's one of the best in the world, which is pretty impressive for a country that uh, is uh, started fairly late in developing uh, high levels of medicine and high levels of uh, technology. Uh, so I was very impressed by that institute. They deal with hundreds of thousands of patients, most of them not with macular degeneration, but many of them with macular degeneration. So since, uh, unless most people have had a chance to see this short abstract, I'll read it quickly, and it's a kind of a introduction. Uh, how many people have not seen it? Okay, I'll read. So the title again, Visual Distortions in Macular Degeneration. And I'll make a few comments as I go along. Uh, macular degeneration has uh, 
many different forms, of course, many different degrees of severity. It's a new field for me. Uh, it, it happened in our family, came on very quickly. Uh, my wife, who kindly came here to listen to me, uh, was uh, diagnosed, uh, sort of, it feel, seemed to remember it was almost overnight. She, her, she found that her vision had all kinds of problems that came on in a matter of weeks or months. And then I'd like to mention a person, Dr. Robert Avery, who is a distinguished ophthalmologist in Santa Barbara. Uh, uh, her regular eye doctor uh, saw right away what the trouble was and said, made an appointment for her at once to see him. And he said he wasn't sure that he could make it. He was in Oxnard when I talked with him. And I don't see him. Bob, are you here? Possible he will come in late. Uh, I'd like you to meet him. He's an excellent uh, person. When we... Uh, started becoming acquainted with his clinic, which is on Mitchell Torino Street here. Um, uh, that was his clinic. Uh, he now has uh, something like eight or ten up and down the coast here. Uh, very highly regarded. Uh, holds regular uh, meetings, people coming from maybe a hundred miles, and is a, a leader in this. Not in macular degeneration, but in uh, other forms of blindness. Macular degeneration is very tough. Progress has been very slow. So many people say, well, I think I'm not going to make any difference here. I'll do something else. Uh, even, even so, I mentioned India, for example, where they are uh, working very hard on it. And I gave them a similar presentation to the one that I'm uh, going to be giving you. So now I read a few, uh, three paragraphs. Uh, when a small child first becomes aware of a tree or a house, he is often puzzled how such big objects can fit into his small eyes. A mere inch in diameter. Is this is there some kind of miracle going on here? The macula is a very small amoeba like spot, much smaller than the entire eye. It's about two millimeters in diameter. When I say amoeba-like, I suggest something that is not the shape of a worm or uh, an irregular, circular-like shape. Two millimeters in diameter. Uh, it's located on the retina. Retina goes mostly on the back side of the eye, inside the eye, of course. And uh, it's about, I think I said that already, varies in size a little, but 
sort of two millimeters in diameter. Everything you see, right, is processed by that little spot. So is it a miracle? Well, the more I <laughs> learn about it, the more I give an affirmative answer. It's amazing. It's perhaps the most amazing organ uh, of uh, humans and other animals. Uh, now, most visual information is absorbed as light by this little thing, the macula. But there is some information that everybody who drives a car knows. Uh, uh, when you drive a car, your biggest danger is more or less in front of you, but sometimes there's a danger coming uh, from the side. And you don't see very sharply what happens on the side, but you see there is something moving there, and you take the necessary action. Uh, this is the so-called peripheral vision, and uh, it has different responses to different colors than uh, the macula. Uh, colors are not as vivid, but you can see something more or less the way I'm stretching out my arms. Something. If something is behind my arms, you may not see it at all. But there's a large angle over which you see something, peripheral vision, very important. And uh, indispensable in a civilization that depends on cars. We all know that. Uh, so that's why I say most visual information is absorbed by light, as light, by the macula. Now what happens when the light is absorbed uh, it's and this so-called central vision, which is the light that's absorbed by the macula, uh, starts on an interesting journey. Of course, the macula is in the back of the eye, so all kinds of things have happened before it gets there. First through the cornea etc., the pupil. Uh, when it gets through the macula, where much of it is absorbed by what one calls the front of the macula, and uh, after being absorbed as light, as physicists we know, when light is absorbed, uh, there is an electronic excitation, and at that point, the light leaves through the optic nerve at the back of the eye, and also at, at the back, back of the retina, and it moves along this optic nerve, not as light, of course, but as electricity. You know there's an electric excitation when light is absorbed, and that's the origin of this electrical impulse. And it moves a considerable distance right into your head where the uh, brain's uh, visual cortex is located. And there another miracle happens because there it is converted into human consciousness, into perception. 
Uh, nobody understands that, but that is going on. We had in this room, I think, we had a uh, colloquium by a neuroscientist uh, on this campus. Uh, he didn't particularly talk about that, but uh, uh, he did speak about aspects of perception, and that's uh, still really mysterious. Uh, now, macular degeneration, I've talked about the macula. Macular degeneration uh, can be seen with uh, lasers, and uh, so one knows what a degenerate macula looks like. Uh, a healthy macula presents on its front side, facing forward, a smooth, flat surface, a degenerate macula, a wrinkled surface. Can have other forms of illness, but we are speaking here on visual distortion, and uh, that is mostly accompanied by irregular wrinkles. And they are, of course, related to the distorted percep perception. So this uh, colloquium will deal with distortions of the macula. It aims to eliminate these distortions. Uh, the medical treatments can't do that. In these roughly 100 years, they've made very little progress. Um, we have made some progress maybe even considerable progress, but it's in a, in a small area of the whole field. And the progress that we've made, we've made as uh, my co-worker here, uh, Jim Klingsern, who's sitting at the other end of these tables, is a very fine engineer. He had worked on campus, he was known on campus, and he was highly recommended to me by one of my engineering colleagues. And we have now worked together five years about, and uh, we meet every week for a couple of hours, and uh, uh, we've made some progress in uh, eliminating the visual distortions perceived by the patients, uh, if not eliminating, uh, reducing uh, the distortions. But then there's this, in the last several years, great excitement about dealing with macular degeneration using stem cells. There are chemical treatments uh, that deal with other aspects of macular degeneration. Another common problem associated with it is that a patient with macular degeneration His central vision is affected. The objects he looks at are often distorted, sometimes distorted beyond recognition. 
Uh, reading for many people becomes very difficult. It's one of the main problems. Uh, <coughs> ah, thank you very much. Uh, so, probably most of you have seen picture of the human eye, and uh, there are all kinds of uh, medical terms. Macular, you can see in the back. Uh, the optic nerve goes out and eventually traverses something like uh, maybe six or eight inches before it reaches the uh, in your skull, the visual cortex, and, and then you become aware of the fact that you are seeing something. So you see all kinds of little stuff lying here. And towards the end of my presentation, uh, we'll uh, show you some of them. And, and we'll show you, uh, I've mentioned a couple of miracles. Uh, we'll show you something else. And uh, you can judge whether you think that is a miracle or not. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, say a few words about my colleague, uh, Jim Klingshorn. It's been a real pleasure working with him. Uh, he is the, for example, the computer expert in our team. and. Uh, but is an excellent general consulting engineer. Uh, another person that I'd like to introduce is at the end of the second row. Uh, that's uh, Jeb, who is in charge of the physics uh, workshop. And uh, we'll show you a couple of things that he has made for us. I think he's become quite interested in the subject. And uh, I'm always very proud to be able to introduce him as the person who makes the actual hardware. Uh, big one? I'm sorry. Yeah, is he here? Where is he? Oh, have you been, were you here when I began to introduce you? Yes, I'm delighted to introduce Bob Avery. Thank you, Jim. Uh, you were the first person I tried to introduce, uh, but you, you hadn't arrived. Uh, so Bob Avery uh, was the ophthalmologist who took care of my wife when she was diagnosed with this problem. And since after a while she was, uh, she, had, she had stopped driving, so I was became the driver. And that's how I uh, met Bob Avery. And uh, he was, uh, he's become a good friend, was a very generous with his most valuable time. He was very frequently, because he was busy in other aspects of his profession, uh, meet us uh, on the weekends uh, in his uh, uh, clinic on Mitchell Torino Street here in Santa Barbara. Um, and he has maintained an interest and accessibility to us uh, for these uh, many years now. Uh, he, incidentally, is widely appreciated. When we first came over there, he had this one clinic with several uh, other professional people working there. And he now has closer to 10 clinics up and down uh, 
the coast here. And uh, enjoyed uh, great respect in his profession. I was also invited to give a presentation at the Jules Stein Institute at UCLA. Uh, again, it's a great institute, great reputation. They don't do much for macular degeneration. Too many people have tried and not gotten very far. Uh, which is the reason it, they asked me to come down there. Now, I'm not an MD. I'm certainly not an ophthalmologist. Uh, uh, but as I learned mostly from Bob Avery a little bit about what is going on there and because of my very strong personal interest in this problem, I began to read about it and, well, I've been uh, a physicist for about 80 years. And so I couldn't help pick up some things. Uh, and I saw this whole problem through the eyes of a physicist. There's a strange anomaly because the uh, uh, Nobel Foundation decided to give me a Nobel Prize in chemistry, which I know almost not at all. Uh, I was, my experience went so far that during the Second World War, because I was a German Jewish refugee in Toronto, the uh, department head said, you're a German citizen, I can't allow, allow you into my building. So I was literally forbidden to study chemistry. And I never caught up until the very end. <laughs> uh, so thank you for coming, Bob. Uh, OK. Let's see, we have a PowerPoint show, and Jim, can you take care of it for me? Uh, so here's the first, uh, we have about 20 slides. Uh, I trust you can all read this. And so I'll be just dash right through it. I've said much of this. Our goals are two, we want to quantitatively learn what the distortions are the perceptual distortions are uh, accompanied by macular degeneration. And we want, here's where the, my physics background comes in, develop uh, optical and computer-based methods to compensate for the perceived macular distortions, at least partially. Uh, the picture, well, you have these words, and uh, they're not really central to what I'm talking about, except the macula in the back. And you do see the optic nerve coming out of the eye on its way. and carrying electrical uh, 
uh, impulses into the uh, visual cortex. Uh, next, please. Okay, there is there was a gentleman by the name of Amsler, and he had a very good simple idea, which is uh, used by everybody who has any kind of uh, distortion of vision. And uh, uh, macular patients, even if that's not their principal problem, uh, there's some distortion. And uh, Bob Avery told me there are other, there are other uh, optical problems that involve distortions of vision. Uh, this was uh, first, uh, uh, I think, appeared in a text written in the 1940s by Dr. Amsler, named after him. Uh, so there's some text can be seen and read even in the back. Uh, so I, I won't read it. Uh, and uh, very simple geometry. It's a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter, usually a piece of paper with a grid on it. And uh, in the middle of the grid, uh, we've put a, a red dot. Usually that's not used. At least is not there. Um, and a healthy eye sees this beautiful regular square grid with a uh, hundred small squares. Sometimes, for example, we tend to use fewer squares. Uh, sometimes we also uh, use uh, smaller overall grids. I had such a thing here, but I don't see it now. Uh, yes, well, here's a, here's a, a mini uh, tool. Who uses this mostly? Tailors. It's called a thread counter. And uh, uh, I should. Oh, uh, Jim, is the bigger one in that carton? So this is what tailors use, and they cost about ten dollars. And but you can for a little more money. And can you open it and stand it up, please? Yeah. So this is the same thing on a smaller scale, and it's very simple. There's an opening down below. Let's say you have a piece of cloth. You want to measure how many threads per square centimeter or per centimeter. Uh, and uh, so you stand it up like that. This is a pretty good magnifying glass, moderate. And, and here, uh, I have put an Amsler grid uh, at the bottom, and that's the standard Amsler grid, 10 by 10 centimeter, and uh, overall size, and consisting of uh, 100, sometimes 400 uh, small squares. And uh, People with macular degeneration that is still changing with time uh, usually uh, place or glue such a grin, uh, grid on the refrigerator, and in the morning when they wake up and have breakfast, they look at it, and do they see it like this? No. When there's macular degeneration, these lines are wiggly, 
and more or less weekly. Uh, serious cases are prevented from reading. Uh, and uh, another common and very upsetting uh, occurrence are regions, irregular regions, more or less circular, more or less gray, light gray, dark gray, black, uh, uh, that occupy a large or significant part of what the patient sees when he looks at an Amsler grid. And that's, of course, very annoying uh, and, and a serious handicap. Uh, my, uh, is, is anybody here from, from the office uh, uh, on Hollister, the eye vision uh, place? Uh, don't see any hands. Uh, the uh, one of the doctors there is going to meet with my eyes. My wife, she has that problem, and she finds it's her most serious problem. And uh, so he and I will meet and. We have an eye of uh, an idea how to uh, work around these dark areas, which we'll try out. Uh, okay. Now, back to uh, macular de degeneration as a disease. Uh, the patient wears his normal reading glasses, if any. He is presented uh, with an Amsler grid. In the medical profession, I think that's almost always, maybe always, a, a 10 by 10 centimeter grid. Uh, and typically that is put on a computer monitor. The patient, uh, if he's not short-sighted or far-sighted, uh, looks at it from a distance of about 40 centimeters. Uh, for some purposes, he uses both eyes. That's if there are issues with his so-called binocular vision. <coughs> we. Uh, I uh, always uh, ask the patient to uh, put a patch on one eye and to look at everything uh, with the other eye. Sometimes, of course, one eye is pretty good, another eye can, can be blind, and uh, I won't say any more about that. Uh, now the patient looks at this uh, grid and sees, first of all, the lines. I'm going to be concentrating, by the way, on the lines that rather than the dark areas, although many patients, for example, my wife, finds the Wiggles of the lines are not as uh, difficult for her to handle than these dark areas. Hopefully, we found, found a way of working around that. Uh, now, we use a computer as people doing any experimental work often do. Uh, here, the computer aspects have not been uh, that difficult, particularly in the hands of my 
friend and colleague, Jim. Uh, the mathematics, surprisingly, has been very challenging. And uh, I'll say a little bit about that later. Uh, so in order to, to handle the mathematics, I would say uh, it's helpful to have a bachelor's degree in mathematics. You need much more than simple uh, algebra and geometry. Uh, okay, the head is fixed by a chin rest. Can you find it, Jim? We just manufactured a picture of it this morning. There it is. So, chin rest. Uh, some of you, no doubt, have had one in use. And it is important, obviously, that the head is kept steady during examination or treatment. And so that's a simple object. Uh, now, you remember the red dot on the middle of the Amsler grid? The Amsler grid is 40 centimeter in front of the patient. And uh, as we all know, even if I hold my head perfectly steady, which is what the chin rest helps you do, uh, you can move your eyes while your head is uh, steady. And that also makes uh, the ex any examination difficult. So uh, the patient aims and maintains his gaze on the central red dot of the Amsler grid. Uh, he uses simple software and the mouse or the computer to straighten the vertical and horizontal lines, all of which are more or less wiggly, until he perceives the grid as perfect. Perfect in the sense of perhaps uh, 80% or better. Uh, yes. Uh, the, during the, the straightening procedure with the mouse, the computer is connected to it in such a way with a simple program that it records the deviations from perfect location of each of the intersection points of the Amsler grid. Uh, and these sometimes, I have one uh, image here that shows a rather advanced degree of macular degeneration. Uh, you'll see that in a minute or two. Uh, so displacements in mild cases are perhaps on the order of a couple of millimeters. Uh, the distance between the lines in the traditional grid is one centimeter or even half a centimeter in some. Uh, and uh, the computer automatically records the displacements. 
uh, of the intersection points. So there are, these displacements are mostly in the two uh, dimensions of the paper, of the grid, but there are virtual displacements uh, perpendicular to the paper also. Uh, I will not speak about these anymore, but there is some interest in those displacements. Also, they are smaller, typically, than the displacements in, in the, what we call the XY plane, which you can visualize on the screen of the computer. Okay, uh, I think I've said that in words, and you see the mouse, the, the black object there, and uh, by moving that up and down, you straighten out the green line. Uh, not perfectly but uh, sometimes very well. Uh, next slide. Well, oh, I'm sorry, yes, we just uh, uh, quite recently put that in, forgot about it. Uh, now, we are, uh, all these, uh, quite a few years that Jim and I have worked together, uh, we have worked along two lines. One is uh, <coughs> an approach in which the computer is essential and the second one in which glass is essential, like the magnifying glass here, or you see a piece of glass lying there, which I'm reserving for the end of the talk. It will be a surprise to you. Uh, How much time do we have left? I'm going, I'm going to... Mm, how much time have I used? I've used almost an hour. Yes. And after, how much more time do people get uh, nervous? <laughs> Can I have another 20 minutes? Okay. Uh, can you pull that towards you because I thought I would be able to see this. But. Thank you. Pardon? I can't hear what you say. What if I talk for a few minutes? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, yes, we have arranged that. And this is the part that he was going to be uh, talking about correction by computer. So I've said that we've moved along two directions. One in which the computer is, uh, plays a central and decisive role, and one in which uh, glass, like ordinary reading glasses and so on, is the key thing. And Jim is on. So as Walter said, we um, have two types of correction. The simplest in a lot of ways is to use a computer for correction. Um, we focused on reading a lot because that's one of the things that people, as they start to lose their sight, they miss the most. Um, so um, one way to correct by computer is to take text that's already on the computer, for instance, your email or, or whatever, um, and then apply this distortive correction in real time as you're reading. 
And um, so one of the ways that we've, we've thought about different ways to do that, you know, if you look at a, a page of newsprint, you might, as your eye scans across it, that, that distortion, that correction would have to scan with your eye. Um, another way that maybe is more natural is to have the actual text stream past your, the screen in like a ticker tape fashion. Um, so we have a little uh, demonstration here of what that might look like. Now, if you um, watch this, you'll see that it's, it look, appears distorted. And um, the patient would look at the very center. We use this uh, white kind of round uh, blob, if you will, to help focus the patient's eye in the center. So as you see, uh, this is what it would look like without the correction to the patient. And obviously, it's very distorted as it scans past. And the next slide will show what it would look like with the correction. So that the patient would look at the very center. Um, that distortion, that correction would be applied. And as he looks at it, it should look perfect or nearly perfect to the patient um, as the correction is applied. Now, there's other ways to apply that correction, especially if you kind of broaden the idea of what a, a computer is. Um, if you use a, a handheld computer or video glasses. Um, so, for instance, you've seen these kind of video glasses here where um, you can watch a movie uh, from uh, right through the glasses. Well, you could modify that a little bit, put a, a small camera right here on the nose piece, a small computer in your pocket, or maybe even built right into the nose piece as well, and apply the correction in stereo, one in each eye. So if you think about it, each eye in an AMD patient is going to have a different correction. And so the nice thing about this approach is that you could have a correction correct for each eye in stereo um, and running in real time. So this is kind of a mock-up. We actually put together a mock-up. Our friend Paul Hamsla helped us uh, uh, set that up, and it uh, was an interesting approach. Um, if you use a little handheld computer or just like a cell phone, then you can build. The, these have cameras built right into them too. With the, so you can actually in real time just scan over the the text like a magnif. Use it almost like a magnifying glass. It can magnify, but at the same time apply that distortive correction. So um, that's very effective, and we've actually programmed this phone to do that. And here's kind of a mock-up up here of how it appears distorted to the patient, but on the screen it would look um, perfect to the patient, undistorted. And so that's what we mean by a dynamic correction. As your eye moves, um, as your the camera moves, as you scan across the reading material, the correction would be applied dynamically um, as you as you read, for instance, or even as you walk around if you had these type of uh, video glasses on. Now we'll go back to the second type of correction. This is where we've had um, interesting uh, mathematical problems. Luckily, we have a mathematical wizard in the group, being Walter. And um, so we've been working on trying to understand what the surface of a glass slab would look like that applies that same distortive correction. And I'll pass the mic back to Walter, and he can tell you about correction by a refractive material. OK. Uh, the David doesn't need any lessons in mathematics. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, the diagnostic part, uh, I've spent a few mo moments on that. Uh, we have the patient look in a certain way at an Amsler grid. He finds that the intersection points have all moved more or less. And uh, he puts them back with a the mouse uh, where they belong. 
And if he would do this perfectly, he would uh, now see a, a perfect Amstel grid. The technician who helps him while he's doing all this, who's seen a perfect Amstel grid before the scientists have done anything to him, now that they've fooled around with him, he sees the grid now distorted. Uh, the, uh, uh, you see a slab, uh, Jim, could you just hold that up so people can just be aware of it? Uh, here, here, this is a 10 by 10 centimeter slab. It has, and that's the mathematical challenge, it has a pretty sophisticated pattern on it. And of course, since it's no longer flat, uh, the technician with normal eyes, uh, when he looks through this at some text or at the pattern of, or, or at an Amsler grid, all this is distorted by the irregularities, I call them, but they're very uh, carefully uh, uh, created uh, in the vicinity of the top surface of this slip, uh, of this uh, 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 slab, is what I want to say. So you see there's an, that's obtained with an uh, by picture, and the legend is that a refractive contoured slab for correcting AMD, age-related macular degeneration, distortions, and it's created by our own machine shop, one of the best in the world, uh, here is the gentleman who runs it, and uh, we couldn't have done any of this without the help of somebody with his uh, uh, great skills. Uh, his, name, his name is Jeff. Uh, okay, here's a little mathematics. Uh, uh, think of the slab uh, that you're working on as horizontal. Z is, of course, then the vertical direction. And the pattern is, uh, for a variety of reasons, must be such that the four top edges of that slab uh, stay put, and we call Z at that level of the top surface or the top edges. Uh, uh, we, we reckon Z from that height. And here comes some of this mathematics that I've warned you about. This is uh, an appro the appropriate uh, Fourier series that uh, conserves the position of the four top uh, edges. Uh, a Fourier series uh, is supposed to be infinite, but it, it usually converges quite well. Here we would need something in a two-dimensional Fourier series, we'd need something like uh, altogether 50 terms in order to describe a, uh, a seriously distorted uh, eye. Uh, next, please. Uh, okay. 
That's actually, again, Jim's department. So can you take that? So, in order to generate this lab, we know what the patients, uh, that they've edited that grid, so we know what the distorted grid looks like. And we know that we have to create a distortion that's exactly opposite of that in sign. So, um, the basic idea is to take these sinusoidal surfaces, one at a time, um, in the computer, so this is a summation. There's lots of choices for the AM and the amplitudes of the signs. So we use a trial and error procedure, simple procedure, where you just try different combinations of the AMNs for all the different um, uh, amplitudes of all the different coefficients in the sign series. Since uh, computers are fast these days, you can get through that um, milliseconds per per candidate surface. So we generate lots and lots of candidate surfaces. We minimize the difference between the patient's diagnosis and the, <coughs> and the distortion that this candidate surface generates. And we just minimize the, some of the square differences of those two, um, of those two mechanisms. We require the surface to be smooth so that the infinite series expansion for C can be cut off after about 50 terms. And in practice, it turns out that with um, n equals 7 for x and n equals 7 for y gives us a very, um, a very good surface to, to correct everything we've run across so far with real patients. So in summary, we run lots of lots of rays through candidate surfaces until we find the one that best corrects the, for the patient's AMD. This is some notation we use for the slab displacement vectors. I think we don't really need to go into too much detail here, except that this, the bottom equation here shows how the uh, displacement vectors for the slab and the displacement vectors for MD, the macular degeneration, cancel each other. They're the negative of each other, negative sign. You make the slab so that they cancel each other. And now Walter has a demonstration for you with a glass lab. Oh, yeah. Sure. So we're going to switch from the computer here to a, to this guy. Why don't you do it? So again, this is an ample grid. The flat, make sure the flat surface is down. The flat surface is down. So, <laughs> that doesn't show up very well, does it? Um, so, as you can see, this particular slab that represents the patient's macular degeneration um, distorts the Amsler grid quite a bit. And if we take a slab that represents the correction um, and place it on top, it completely corrects, completely corrects the distortion. Uh, Jim, mm -hmm. uh, put it on some, uh, do we have these transparencies with reading material? No, I don't think so. No. Uh, see if, if the light shines through this. Just use this. One of these slides. This should work. Right? No? Mm -hmm. Yes.
You see, with the macula, just with the problematic macula only, uh, introduces uh, with the macula only the patient experiences distortions. That's to say the bottom slab, but with the macula plus the correcting slab, the distortions are eliminated. Uh, you saw that with the grid. Uh, is there a uh, folder that, that might have some text? Is that? Yeah, let's see if, if it goes. Yeah, it's, we we had some text on a on a uh, transparency. Okay, yes. my my assistant told me she had to leave, so we can't show that to you. But yeah. So the fact is that imagine you have some type text on a transparency. Everybody here has uh, good vision, and uh, he can read it uh, very well. Uh, a patient with macular degeneration, uh, you can see that he sees the Amsler grid distorted, and of course he will also see text distorted, and if that distortion is sufficiently substantial, he, he cannot read the text. But if you then put the correcting slab on top of it, it turns out that the correction is almost 100%. This would be the undistorted Amsler grid with text. This would be as perceived by an AMD patient obviously needs correction. It looks distorted. This is the perception of the text through the correcting device by a person without macular degeneration. Um, these two are the opposite. You can kind of tell where one um, bends in, the other pushes out. And then finally, when the patient views the text through the correcting device, it should look perfect to the patient. And that pretty much wraps up our presentation. Walter will give you a, an update of our current status and the outlook. Okay. And so the analysis of the diagnostic procedure is complete. Uh, the computer program that creates a dynamic, time-dependent spatial correction uh, has been implemented. You have seen it. Uh, the time square type uh, uh, ticker tape uh, script and uh, prototype optical slabs providing significant correction have been fabricated. And in one case, and I'm sorry, this was supposed to be the high point of the talk, but apparently my assistant <laughs> walked away with it. Uh, uh, we have, uh, for reasons that we understand and that are interesting, and that we will uh, develop quite generally within the next few weeks, we think. We can uh, 
develop it to a point where people who may just have so much visual distortion that they cannot read ordinary text uh, should be able to read it. Uh, I would say uh, use a figure of maybe 80% as well as uh, people with normal vision. That's where we are. And I thank you, we both thank you for your attention. For a, for a point, there uh, are uh, only two. Well, what, no, I have to understand that. Uh, because we do move point by point. And, uh, and you first asked, spoke about a point. Yes, but... Yes, two-dimensional. Two-dimensional. John? No, you oh, have sorry. you have intersection points, and these points move from where they were to another place along a straight line. Okay, I think Professor Cardi has a question. The displacement is proportional to the gradient, the local gradient, of your function z. Yes. Right. So uh, that means that it has zero curl, right, because it's a gradient. Yes. So how do you know that these displacements have zero curl? Yes, we, uh, thank you. Very good question. We have... Uh, uh, discuss this at length. Uh, there is a famous uh, theorem by Helmholtz about vector fields that um, a vector field can be uniquely decomposed into a, an irrotational field and a field without divergence. And uh, uh, from our search of the literature, uh, this the, there are examples of both kinds, and there are examples where uh, only one of them occurs and the other one not, and there are examples where both occur. Uh, now, here, with uh, glass, uh, it uh, the uh, vector field is a gradient field, and it has no curves. Jim? Uh, yes. So uh, this seems to us uh, might turn out to be of some medical interest, mm -hmm. whether uh, human tissue, muscle tissue, let us say, mm -hmm. uh, in some circumstances does, in other circumstances does not have, uh, uh, does not have curls or produce curls. Uh, we are, we have been thinking about that for years, actually. But it's not been our central uh, uh, interest, so that in uh, 
the last uh, several years, we have simply, uh, since there is this Helmholtz theorem that divides the two uh, kinds of vector, f vector fields, uh, we have, uh, but not in my presentation, we have limited ourselves to uh, uh, glass-like uh, gradients, and uh, they, are, they don't occur. Uh, Professor Langer? Uh, no. Well, uh, my understanding of how my eye works uh, is that uh, the visual information comes in, it's accumulated by the retina, the macula uh, comes in and, and does something, but the main thing that happens is that this information is transmitted by the optic nerve to the optical cortex, and it's a map. Now, if I understand correctly, macular de de degeneration uh, interferes with some of that information, or blocks some of that information. I don't understand what is actually being done here. Are, are you just using different uh, nerve pathways to the brain. You're not trans. You're not. The brain is not learning to to interpret it differently. I don't think. Um, or are you uh, doing something else? Uh, sorry, didn't understand your question. Well, what? What? It, you know, if if I have, if my macula has parts of it that aren't working right. Right. Is that your question? Or? Uh, no, no, my, no. no it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, w what are you doing in this process to, uh, uh, to correct that? Are you using different parts of the macula that are working better? Okay. Uh, uh, or, and, and how no. is it connected to the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to the optical cortex? Well, uh, we uh, have, uh, we are religious people. And therefore, we have decided we will not touch the macula. <laughs> it is such a wonderful object that we are not worthy of touching it. <laughs> we do the same kind of thing, except it's considerably more complex, as anybody like you and me do when we put on a pair of glasses. Exactly. And we try to do it so as not to not to uh, uh, hurt the eye. Mm -hmm. uh, other questions? Uh, since it's getting late, perhaps we will thank the speaker again. <laughs>